Okay, so I'm going to continue my series of uh, lectures on um, eigenvector problems in uh, random matrix theory and, and estimation problems uh, using uh, eigenvectors. So uh, today I'll be using quite a bit of, uh, of uh, free probability theory and, and transform that I've written there. And so we'll, we'll be using them today. So it's a bit abstract it's, uh, uh, like that. It's just a bunch of formulas. But uh, well, first I'll, I'll I'll start with reviewing those that I've done for 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 addition. So and then I'll re-erase it because today I'll be mostly doing multi matrix multiplication. But in the case of addition, this is much more like everybody knows or everybody who does uh, free probability or or random or use uh, free probability in random matrices knows about the the additive problem. But let's just um, let me just review it. Suppose that I have. Uh, a matrix C that's built out of the sum of two free matrices, which here I've, I've expressed the fact that A and B are free by explicitly rotating B, the matrix B, by a random rotation. So if, if, if there's a random rotation between A and B, then, then you can use this, but you don't necessarily need this random rotation if, if either matrix is, uh, is by itself rotation invariant, like a Wigner matrix or, or a white Wishart. Okay, but, uh, but to make sure. And so when you have uh, such, a, such a matrix addition, a free addition, then there's a transform that's extremely useful called the R transform. And the R transform is additive. Uh, additive. It behaves a little bit like the generating function of the cumulants in um, like the log, of, uh, the log of the characteristic function in, in the standard probability theory. So the, the log of the characteristic function in, in, in standard probability theory gives you the cumulants and the cumulants are additive under a normal convolution, a normal uh, addition of uh, independent variables. So for free, uh, for free non-commutative variables, is this R transform that's additive. And how is the R transform built? Well, first you build the resolvent, which is a random matrix built from the random matrix A. You take the normalized trace. For me, tau here is always trace divided by the size of the matrix. So it's um, okay, but, uh, but in informal, um, uh, you, in, in formal algebraic setting, you just have an operator of I mean, uh, Camille introduced, I think Camille forgot, what's your notation is phi? Uh, it's phi, yeah. So the, some people use phi, some people use tau. I prefer tau because it's closer to, to, to the trace, but so my tau is Camille's phi. Yeah, and so this is a normalized trace operator and it converges uh, for Z uh, outside of where the eigenvalues are. This actually converges to a deterministic function G of, uh, where, whereas you should really think as this uh, this object here is a is an n by n matrix, so it doesn't converge to anything. It's a it's a random object. It's a random object with poles at the eigenvalues and and projectors, uh, and the residue is a projector on the uh, on the eigenvector. But this is a this is a function that converges. Typically, it has a branch cut uh, where the, the eigenvalues sometimes has Dirac's uh, well Dirac masses show up as poles. Okay, so this function G and it's and since I'm looking at bounded objects, it's always nice and analytic away from the, where the eigenvalues are. So near, near infinity, if, thing, if things are bounded, it, they never extend all the way to infinity. So there's always a region where, where G is well-defined, it's monotonic. And so if it's well-defined and monotonic, then it can be inverted. So this is also kind of a abusive notation, but I find very useful. I have G, G of Z, and then it's functional inverse, I write Z of G. So Z of G is just a functional inverse of this guy. And it, it's as a Taylor series at infinity, it always starts with one over G, which I subtract to build the R transform. And then, then this becomes regular. Uh, this becomes regular at zero, okay? So this function, the R transform is regular at zero. It's the functional inverse of the Stilgis transform minus uh, a one over G. And another, and, and this, the, these relationships the fact that it's additive and uh, from the definition, you can work it ba backwards and you get what is called a subordination relation, which tells you that the Stilgis transform of C at some point uh, Z is related to the Stilgis transform of, of one of the two matrices. In this case, I chose A, evaluated the point which depends on the R transform of B and the, the Stilgis transform itself that I'm trying to compute. So this is a this is a nasty equation because it's an implicit equation. I have G of C here and G of C there, but it's actually quite useful. And what's very strong is that this is true for 
these are still just transforms. So these are functions. This is a this function in, uh, of a complex variable into the complex plane. But this these relationship extend to these big matrices here that are random. Well, uh, uh, but instead of getting, uh, but uh, but of course, uh, uh, there's no, um, it's not an equality between uh, random matrices. It's an equality between the expectation value of a random matrix. And so here, for instance, I assume that the matrix A is deterministic. So if, if the matrix A is a deterministic, this is a, this is a deterministic uh, function of its argument, okay? And so if I average, I should say here, if I average over the noise, of, if I average over B, or if I average over the rotations uh, of B, then I have this relationship that this big, this big matrix G of A, or G of C in this case, so which would be Z identity minus C inverse. If I take the expectation with respect to the noise in B, then I get a relationship with, with G of A, which is Z identity minus A, but where Z, the argument, is the same argument as, as this guy here. And that's extremely useful to compute um, because in, in, uh, in, in this big matrix, I, don't, I have eigenvalue information, but also have eigenvector information because I have projectors on all the eigenvectors. So, so I have, and, and so I have a relationship about average eigenvectors. And when I'm gonna sandwich this relationship with, with certain vectors that I'm interested in, I can compute um, overlap. So how the, for, for me, the, well, when I say overlap, I really mean square overlap, which is the, the, the dot product square of two vectors. Okay. So, but today I'm not going to use this. I'm going to use something, something slightly more complicated, which is the multiplicative case. Okay. So there's, there's a whole zoo of, uh, of transform for the multiplicative case. I won't explain right now the multiplicative case. I'll, 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 I'll explain it when I need it. Okay. So when, when I, uh, it's just, well, the one thing that, the, for the multiplicative case, you could you could use the the Stilges transform, but the equations are a bit more clumsy, and so there's a transform that, that's more natural here. It's the, the what I call the T transform, and the so and so well the, the object I'll be looking at is not no longer Z identity minus A inverse is the matrix the product of this times the matrix A. Okay, um, it turns out that this object has the equations that are much simpler. So I'll try to, to build. If I try, if I can build this combination, matrix A, I, I use zeta because uh, I use a different Z because I want to, when I uh, take the inverse, I want to say that this is the inverse of this function and not the inverse of that function. This is the, the drawback of this notation saying that the function, okay. but uh, the, the point is that um, I want to build a function, which is A times zeta identity minus A inverse. And if I can build this function, then I, I can say a lot of things about this because of, of all these powerful relationships that I explained a bit uh, better in, in a, uh, when, when I need it. Okay. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that um, when, when I talked about the, um, the problem of uh, phase retrieval, remember I defined a function h of z, which was really the normalized trace of h, h transpose. Um, what was it called? G22 of Z. Okay. And I didn't compute this object and I, I still won't do it, but I'll show just, I'll just give you a hint that the technology that I'll develop today for this uh, estimation problem can be used to compute this object. Okay. But it will be too, uh, take too much time and it's just a computation. But once you know how to use, if you know how to use this technology, then it's relatively straightforward to compute something like this. So remember G22, G22 was, um, well, uh, of Z was an object of this type Z uh, one uh, Z identity minus M two two inverse, and um, and M two two is really a colored was really a colored Wishard it was really uh, H F H transpose where F is a diagonal matrix of the the objects F of Y. And, and the important thing is that it was f of y only depends on, on the element one, which are no longer in the matrix two, two. So f is really the diagonal element of f were independent of, of this, this wish art, these, um, these, these white matrices. Okay, so basically what I have here is some sort of colored wish art. 
um, so a, a colored witch art with, with the, uh, the color in the middle rather than on the outside, but it's still some sort of colored witch art matrix. And I needed to compute, and I have its resolvent, and I wanted to compute the normalized trace of a white witch art with the colored version. And if I can use, uh, and, and, the, the, and, the, and the, the, this G here is, will be related to the T transform, and I have a subordination relation for a T transform, so I can compute all this, and it will depend. In the end, it will depend on the S transform. I haven't really told you what the S transform of this F. Okay, so, so basically, if I know the statistics of F, I can compute its S transform, and I can compute all this. So I won't do this, but, but I'll do something similar in this problem of, of but I just want to say that problems like that are solvable. That's, that's all I want to, and, and well, just advertisement for my book, uh, it's in there. <laughs> okay. Um, but now my point was to go back to, to covariance matrices. So I talked about covariance matrices uh, on Monday. Okay, so today the, the two sessions will be on, this, the, on, on covariance matrices. And so really there's, there's a direct problem and there's the inverse problem. So the direct problem is I have a matrix C that I know, and I measure some data H, and I convince you that you can model the data at square root of C H zero. Okay, so H is some rectangular matrix where the columns have covariance C. Okay, and H zero is a white rectangular matrix. So, uh, so H zero is just a n by t i i d n zero one. And then I color it by multiplying by square root of C. And if you, if you actually do a, a, a random number generation, this is the way to, to generate correlated data. Okay, you, you multiply by a matrix on the left, and then all the columns are correlated um, within the columns. And then each column is independent. Okay, so you have independent columns and correlation within the columns in, in this uh, setting. Okay, so the direct problem, and then and then I, I measure a sample covariance matrix uh, as one over T H H transpose, which can be modeled as one over T square root of C H H H naught. Okay. And this combination H naught H naught transpose over T is a white Wishart. So I can really write this as square root of C Wishart. And I put a Q here because the Wishart depends on the parameter Q and Q is just the ratio of N over T, okay? And remember, standard statistics is when T goes to infinity at N fixed. So standard statistics is when Q goes to zero, but we're interested in the limit where Q is finite, um, okay? And I told you that in the direct problem, um, in the direct problem, what happens is that if Q is greater than one, then E has, uh, some zeros again, zero again values, and actually quite a lot of them. Okay, and but also if Q is greater than zero, um, then its variance, so trace of E squared minus trace of E squared is is equal to the variance of C plus Q. Okay, so. This, 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 this variance here that I'm computing, you can think of it as the variance of the eigenvalue distribution. So the eigenvalue distribution is wider for the sample covariance matrix than from the, from the, the, the true covariance matrix. And it's, it's wider by a factor of Q. So again, if Q is zero, then the, um, it has the same, well, if Q is zero, really E converges to C. But if Q is non-zero, then E doesn't converge to C. You can already see that it's, E has the same mean, um, which I will always uh, choose to be one. So I'll normalize things always at the, so tau, I'll choose tau of C to be one, okay? So tau of C equals one means that the, 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 um, the uh, typical eigenvalue of C is one. So the average eigenvalue of C is one. So this is just a normalization. I can always scale my problem to have this condition, okay? And so, so C has some variance, um, except, well, or C, C could be the identity. If C is the identity, then C has no variance. And then this term is zero. So when C is the identity, the, 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 think of it, the, the, the eigenvalue distribution of the identity. So this is rho of lambda. It's just a Dirac at one. 
Okay, so this is for C equals the identity. Okay, but and in this case, the variance is zero, but the variance of E is non-zero, it's Q. Okay, and it actually in that case, we know E, E is called the Marcus Nicole Pasteur distribution. So uh, in that case, you would have an E as this shape from lambda minus to lambda plus with lambda plus or minus equals one plus or minus square root of Q squared. And again, if Q goes to zero, uh, then lambda plus equals lambda minus equals one and the Martian Copastor uh, converts to Dirac. Okay? But in general, for Q non-zero, well, this is true for Q between, well, this is, uh, it, it, I, I won't discuss much the, Q, the, the case Q greater than one, but in the case Q greater than one, you also have a Dirac uh, at zero, okay? But, but the, the Martian Copastor, uh, um, at least the Seelgis transform of the Martian Copastor has a pole at zero precisely when this happened. But anyway, I, I, I won't have time. So let's forget about the case Q equals one. Let's just assume now that Q is between zero and one. But, um, but the, 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 the case Q greater than one can be solved. It's just a, not to, to complexify too much. And I, I'm not gonna talk about it. Okay, so, and, I found, uh, and the other thing is that um, I, um, I, I, sh I showed the equation for a slightly ver different version of this. I, I showed that, uh, that there's, a, there's, a, there's an integral equation. If you, if you write E, not like this one, but uh, H0, it's a similar problem. If you write this problem, okay, then then by considering E as a sum of projectors, you can write an integral equation related to the eigenvalue of C to the the, the eigenvalue the, the the spectrum of E, and this was actually the work of uh, Martin Cohen Pasteur in '67, but by by uh, by moving around matrices and and considering matrices that have similar eigenvalues, you can actually find a spectrum the same method for, for this problem is just a, a bit more cumbersome but i'm going to give you a, a more direct method to compute this and it's using uh, these transforms okay so this is again still in, in the direct problem and now, now i can erase so I, actually today we won't be doing the additive case at all uh, but uh, so i can, can erase but the additive i mean if you if you need to know one transform you should know the r the S, the, the S, you should only know. You, should, you can forget about it and and relearn about it when you need to do multiplicative problems. But the R, you should know by heart. I mean, the R is, is super useful. It's, it's everywhere. Okay, and and there's even relationship between the R and the S. So, okay, but anyway, but today we're going to talk about the S. Okay, so maybe it's a good time now. To um, so you see. Okay, so the notation is bad because it's, uh, it's on this. It doesn't matter. So I have my sample covariance matrix. So let me just write this is here. This is important. So my sample covariance matrix is uh, the square root of a matrix um, uh, multiplied. And the, the, well, well, this is also just it happens naturally, but you want it's, it's important that a matrix like that is symmetrical. So, uh, or if, if you can do all this with, with, with Hermitian matrices and, and in a complex case, and in this, this case, this would be in a, in a Hermitian matrix. So it has real eigenvalues and it can be diagonalized. So it's nice to work with the symmetric product. So if I go back here, I really want to do the product of the matrix. Oh, so it doesn't. Sorry. Okay. So here, the, really morally what this is, is the product of the matrix A and the matrix B. So I'm assuming that A, uh, um, A and B are positive definite. Okay. I mean, I can relax these assumptions, but for the, the what we'll be considering, they, they could have zero eigenvalues and one of them could be non-positive definite, but let's just assume it's, it's simpler to assume that both matrices are, are positive, uh, positive definite. So I can take the square root and the square root of the matrix I, I call you, you can, the, the, you can, there are many ways of, of seeing it, but this, the, the one that's, uh, that, that's symmetrical is you, you diagonalize the matrix 
you take the square root of the eigenvalues, which you can do because it's positive definite, and then you, you go back in the physical basis. Okay, so, so by square root of the matrix, uh, so really if I have A, which is equal to O, D, O transpose, square root of A is really defined as O square root of D, O transpose. And, and square root of a diagonal matrix is really square root of the elements on the diagonal, okay? So the, and, and I wanna put a square root of A on both sides so that I have a, a, a symmetric matrix, okay? So this is kind of object, I'm, 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 and I, I mentioned this matrix O here is only really needed to ensure that the, the problem is rotationally invariant. Here in the middle, I have a white wish art, and the white wish art is invariant by, uh, uh, you know, uh, in law, a, a, uh, a rotated white wish art is just as likely uh, as, a, as uh, the original white wish art. So, for a white, if B is a white wish art, I don't need these O matrices. I, I, have, I do have a free product, okay? So what I say is that in this problem, there exists a transform S, with, which is multiplicative. So the transform S, the S transform of this matrix C will be equal to the S transform of the matrix A and the S transform of the matrix B, okay? And- hmm? Oh, of course, of course, for all of this is asymptotic. Yeah, 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 it's only true. Yeah, so basically uh, at finite n, there are one over n corrections to all this. Okay, so, so yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so the, the, this notion of freeness uh, doesn't apply. But basically you, uh, so large rotationally invariant matrices are free up to factor one over n. So if you look at the, 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 the equation that you need to satisfy to actually be mathematically free, you, you see that there's a one, there, there are terms in one over N. And so it's only, that's why we say that large, that random matrices are asymptotically free. They're free when, they, when the size goes to infinity. But for us, we're gonna be talking about matrices of size a thousand uh, in real applications and one over a thousand is small enough given all the other modeling error that we make that this is not the, the, the main error. Okay, so so um, yeah, so the, I have these uh, these uh, uh, S transform that multiply, and the definition of the S transform is similar to the, the R, which I uh, so you need you have a you have a transform on the matrix itself. So in this case here, there's kind of the equivalent of a I would call it maybe a T resolvent or the T matrix, and then the, the normalized trace of this T matrix is some function. The same way as the Sturgis transform, it converges in the complex plane outside of where the eigenvalues are. It's actually related to the, the Sturgis transform. So it's just, um, it's, it's just zeta, G of zeta minus one. So it, it's, it, it's very nicely analytic outside of where, it, it, it's very similar. It has, it has a branch cut where there are eigenvalues, it can have poles, but outside of the eigenvalues, it's, it's analytical. And, um, and it's a regular at infinity. This, it's just that the behavior at infinity is slightly different. Uh, is that the, the, the exponent of one over Z are shifted by one and, and you don't have the one over Z pole at infinity. Okay. Um, it's actually uh, mu over Z, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, so from this, you can compute the S transform, which has this, for some reason, well, it's, it's T plus one over T in an inverse of this T transform. And more, um, more beautifully, uh, you have these, um, these uh, subordination relation. So the T transform evaluated at one point of, of the, 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 the product matrix is the T transform of one of the matrices uh, evaluated at a different point that depends on the S transform of the, the other matrix. So, um, and what, what, what I'll be using, um, for to compute uh, eigenvectors is this subordination relation. So if you think of this T matrix, T matrix is again, like the, the, like the resolvent, it's a random matrix, but I can take its expectation value with respect to B. Um, so, so typically I'll build, take the expectation value with respect to the, to the white wish art, which is, we can think of it as a random matrix. So if, I have, if, if A is a fixed matrix and B is a white wish art, for instance, then I could average over the white wish art 
and then I get the relationship that the average of of this object for for the, the product matrix is given by this object for the the determinist matrix A evaluate at some point, which is the same point as here, and this point depends on the um, the S transform. And the last thing I want to say is that why this is also useful um, is because white Wishart have a very simple S transform. So if I have a, a white Wishart parameter Q S Q of T is very simple. It's one over one plus Q T. Okay. So, so if I'm averaging over a white Wishart, this term is relatively simple here. Okay. Uh, in general, it can be quite nasty. Um, so uh, the, this, this S transform. Mark. Yeah. The the subordination relation on the um, on the T matrices here, the this okay. uh, generalized uh, resolvent. Does it become true without the average in the large size limit? No, no, because this is a this is a matrix where the, the eigenvectors are all over the place. It, it's a, yeah. it's an n square object. It doesn't. Yeah, but I mean the the, the resolvent, for example. Can it oh, this this one, yes. So th this no, this no. is a, this is a scalar equation. No, no, but the resolvent seen as a matrix. There are all these notions of local laws, and they, uh, and in certain scales, I mean, you have concentrations at the level of the elements. Yeah, but uh, but you're, I, 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 you're not too close to the real <laughs> axis, no. Because this this is a, this is an object with n square entries, and I don't see how all. Of, I mean, the, no, the the eigenvectors fluctuate. Uh, so, so for instance, think of it this way: if um, if A is diagonal, if A is diagonal, T of A is also diagonal. Uh, and then, um, without the average, it would mean that T of C is diagonal, and yeah, it, it yeah. just cannot be. Uh, it, it's a random matrix; it will have off-diagonal entries. Is it that on average the off-diagonal entries are zero? But I think they made ten. To zero in the large size limit, I, I, or the resolvent of a Wigner, I think that's the case. Um, we can discuss them, but I, I really don't think so. I, re, I think that that uh, you would get uh, absurdity. Um, Do you actually use that in some of your papers? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can get generalized elements, but you can do it for any vector, and so you can take a unit uh, vector uh, with a, just one component equal to one, and this shows that each element essentially concentrates if you're not too close to the real. Okay, axis. yeah, um, okay, yeah, but it, it depends how you use it because, yeah, okay, so the, 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 I see what you mean, um, but but it, it, with this kind of argument. You say that a Wigner matrix is a zero matrix because um, because all the elements are small in a Wigner matrix. All the elements are small. Uh, they all they, if you look at one element of a Wigner matrix, it converges to zero. Mm -hmm. And but the whole matrix itself, when you multiply it, you you multiply n uh, yes. n such random matrices, such uh, random uh, elements. And of course, the fact that you have n of them, uh, they're all small, but it becomes big. So, so indeed, okay, this, this is quite subtle, and thank you for pointing that out. Indeed, um, yeah, but I think this is the best way to see it. A Wigner matrix is essentially element-wise uh, the zero matrix, but collectively, it's definitely not the zero matrix. Yes, so, yes. yeah. So, so you can, yeah. So, so okay. That, that is so indeed point-wise. If you only look zoom on one element, and you're not going to use n elements, then then you're right. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes. Now I see what you were trying to say. There are these what you things saying. by anti-nulls, uh, by uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But you have to be careful um, with these things. You can't treat them collectively anymore. If you say one element converges to zero, uh, n such elements, don't, you, it's very dangerous to treat n elements because because they convert to zero as one over square root of n, yes. or or as one over n. And so when you have n of them. Then, then you, you then you get a spectrum of eigenvalue. This is the the Wigner matrix is definitely not the zero matrix. It has eigenvalues that are between minus two and two, yes. and where the zero matrix has all eigenvalues equal to zero. So so and of course the the eigenvalues are, is a is a function of all the elements. So a function so you have each element converts to zero, but all the elements can, treated together are definitely not non-zero. So okay, so you have to be careful. This is why. Uh, 
I mean, being a physicist, you have you have to 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 be careful with what you do. Where when you're a mathematician, you make precise statements, and 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 vague statements need to be you need to be careful with vague statements. Okay. Anyway, so um, um, so I just want to rewrite. So basically. If I have E equals square root of C, we short Q square root of C, then the, the subordination relation tells me that T E of Z, zeta equals T C of, um, of zeta. Uh, and then I know also that the S of a, a white Wishart of parameter Q is one over one plus Q T. So I have a subordination relation, which I can write as zeta one plus Q TC of zeta. Okay. And this is equivalent to the ugly integral equation that Martian Cohen Pasteur wrote. Okay. So if, if you know C, if you, if you know the eigenvalues of C, you can compute this, it's T transform. And, and this, is an, this is an implicit equation because uh, T e here with T e, yeah, no, so, okay. So, so it's an implicit equation because I have T e here, but I also have T e here. Okay, and uh, in general, it's it's pretty ugly. There's one simple case where C is the identity, so the T matrix is identity. Z, zeta identity minus identity inverse. And this is just essentially the matrix one over zeta minus uh, one. Okay, think of it as a, it's really a matrix. Well, it's, it's uh, yeah, okay, maybe I'll write it this way. It's one over uh, zeta minus one times the identity. Okay, so the, the T matrix of the identity is super easy to compute, and therefore the T transform. So the T of the identity is just one over uh, zeta minus one. Okay, and then I won't do it, but if I say that C here has this very simple T transform, I can develop all this. I get a quadratic equation in T. And if I solve this quadratic equation in T, I get the T transform of the Martian Kupastur law. And with the relationship between the steel just and, uh, and the T transform, I can recover this. this, this the, the, I, can, I can also recover the, the density. I, I can also, you, can also, there, you can also recover directly the density. I mean, the, the, from the T transform, there's a branch cut. And the branch cut is, instead of just being the density, is uh, lambda times the density. Okay, so so the t so basically here what I'm saying, if I do this in this this very simple case, the the white Wishart, then uh, I get a quadratic equation, and there's a branch cut uh, for for t e that I get, and on the branch cut I can recover the uh, the Martian Kupastur law. Okay, so this is a very powerful way of re uh, recovering uh, Martian Kupastur, but it is much. It's very powerful because I can also do any colored one. Okay. There's one case also that's solvable um, that you know you should know about. I'll, I'll talk more about it. Um, is what is called the inverse Wishart. It's one of the few. Well, they're, they're basically only two two random matrix that have very simple. Uh, well, they're they're no not maybe but they're they're. S transforms are, are typically very hard to compute, but there are a few simple cases. One of them is the, the Wishart and the inverse Wishart, which, would, would, which is a, the, the inverse of a Wishart matrix where I rescaled it to have mean one and variance P. It would have S of P equals to one plus PT. Okay. So another, another case of a very simple, um, of a, so, the, so think of the inverse Wishart. You take a Wishart matrix, you invert it. Well, the inverse doesn't have quite mean one, so you change the mean. 
it has some 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 variance which depends on Q, which you rename P. Okay, so this is a this is a matrix with mean one and variance P, but it's really built from from the inverse of a Wishart matrix. And this object has a very simple um, uh, S transform, which means that if I, I inject it here. I also get a quadratic equation that's a bit more nasty because it's a quadratic equation that will depend on P and Q, but I can do and I can have an explicit quadratic formula and basically the only thing we can do uh, is uh, in life are quadratic functions anything cubic or fourth order uh, is, is too messy to 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 to, uh, to work with, but for, for this case you get a, a quadratic equation. Uh, and, and and this is going to be very important. Because uh, so the, 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 like the Jacobi ensemble of random matrices is essentially the product of a Wishart and inverse Wishart. That's one one application. The other one is in Bayesian inference. If you if you do, trying to if you, you this was this this problem that I'm going to talk about uh, inferring the matrix C was done by statisticians uh, I think in around 1980 or late 70s, and they said well the only thing you could do is an inverse Wishart because that's the conjugate prior. So if you know about Bayesian inference, uh, you can pick the prior that's the easiest to work with. It turns out that inverse Wishart are, is, a, and you can do that in finite dimension. Uh, I mean, there's a, um, Pierre Paolo showed you the, uh, the Wishart distribution in, for finite N. The inverse Wishart is also known for finite N and for finite N, they're conjugate in the, in the Bayesian sense. And so if you have a, a, a Bayesian theory of, of random matrices, then the, 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 the easiest prior you can work with is, a, is inverse Wishart. And you can do this inference problem. And if you assume an inverse, uh, inverse Wishart, you get very simple answers, okay? Um, so we're gonna see that if, if, if your matrix C is either white or an inverse Wishart, you get simple answers, okay? In other cases, yeah, you have to do things numerically. Okay, um, tuk, 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 tuk. yeah, let me just start let me state uh, before we break um, the um, the inference problem that I'm going to talk about. Okay, so um, yeah, so basically, I I have a matrix C that I don't know. I measure, but but I measure E, which is uh, I model as square root of C, white Wishart square root of C. But I can model with any, uh, multi, uh, I could actually, um, the, the theory I'm going to develop is a bit more general than that. I can say, I, I, I measure, a, I have a, a matrix C that I don't know, and I have multi, some, some multiplicative noise. I'm just going to call this W, but W is not necessarily a Wishart matrix. It's some noisy matrix that is one on average, but uh, could be, and in, in, some, in some financial application, um, it, it's just that that you have all sorts of correlation. Here we're talking about the, the you can have a, a fluctuating variance, for instance, affected the volatility fluctuates. There are all sorts of, of noise that can happen that multiplicative during the noise that can happen here, and it's just as easy to do a theory, not just for a white Wishart, but for any multiplicative noise. Okay, so my my problem, but the the two things that I want is that so on average my noise is one. And that my that W is rotationally invariant. Okay, so so I can be uh, so I can use so this is really the free product. So really E is in a sense the is a uh, is um, is C is a symmetric free product with 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 C on the with C on the outside. Okay. Okay. Um, now. The question is how uh, I want to build an estimator. I will write chi. Chi is a, so we're going to be a, so I observe e, so it has to be a function of e, and I want chi of e to be an estimator of c. So I don't know c, so my, my data was generated by c, but I don't know it, and I, I observe e, so I want to build an estimator from c. Okay, and the problem is rotationally invariant. The noise is rotationally invariant. Um, and I don't know, well, well, the noise is rotationally invariant and the matrix C itself, I don't know what it is. So I, 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 so I, could, I could do a sort of a Bayesian approach. And if I did a Bayesian approach, um, I would need to, make, to build a prior. 
And what I'm saying is that I have no prior for the eigenvectors okay, um, of, um, of, of C, of the true C. Another way of saying that is that uh, since the problem is completely rotation invariant, I'm going to look in the class of estimators that are rotation invariant. What's a rotation invariant? So this is an important concept. It's a rotationally invariant estimator. Is a, so if I... If I'm given a rotated matrix E, then I'm going to have the same estimate as a non-rotated E up to a rotation. So an estimator that has this property, okay? And what I argue that since if you have no prior on C, then, then necessarily uh, your estimator should be in this class. Another way, and, and, and the co and consequence of this, okay, uh, and, and maybe you'll have more intuition on the consequence, is that your estimator E uh, commutes with E. In other way, another way um, kind of E is in the, sa is in the same basis. So if you if you have a, 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 an estimator in this class, or you can think of directly as um, maybe it's easier to build the intuition about about this statement, is that um, you don't know anything about eigenvectors. You you're trying to estimate the, the the matrix C, but you really have no prior knowledge of its eigenvectors. And the only eigenvectors you have in the problems are those that you observe, those of E. Okay, so. So, so, so um, in a sense, you're stuck with those eigenvectors. There's no, other, no, no, nobody else will give you a direction in space uh, um, other than the, the eigenvectors of E. So, which means that your estimator should stay in the uh, eigenvectors of E. And this is a very strong um, uh, uh, hypothesis. And, and of course, like let me give you two examples where this fails. Um, if you think that E might be, uh, that C might be sparse. So if you have a canonical basis, so, so if, well, first of all, if you have a canonical basis, if you truly believe that there exists a basis in which C is natural, then uh, C might be diagonal on that basis. And this is, this breaks rotation invariance. Um, you might have um, a collective modes. You, 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 you're like in finance, for instance, there's a, there's a, there's a um, the canonical basis, which is, uh, every stock is a, a stock one, stock two, stock three. That 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 that's a basis, and in that basis, there's a, there's actually an eigen mode that's fairly easy to call the market mode, where all the stocks go up or all the stocks go down together, and that breaks rotation invariance. Okay, and the other type of thing that can break rotation invariance is the notion of sparsity. So if you say that that the eigenvectors of C are sparse, that also breaks rotation invariance. So so this hypothesis is very strong, and and in some cases, it's not justified, okay? But, uh, but, but on the other hand, it's very powerful because uh, essentially, uh, and I'm gonna stop here, um, you go from an N-square problem, you're trying to estimate N, the N-square elements of the matrix C, okay? But you really only need to, uh, let me just write finally, that chi of E, you can write it as sum over K, uh, let me write, uh, Psi k vk vk transpose, and just to set the notation, e I diagonalize as sum over k as lambda k vk vk transpose. Okay, so if I diagonalize the matrix E and the v the vk's are its eigenvector, I'm saying that my estimator must be in the same basis, but but the fact that it's in the same basis doesn't say anything about um, the the coefficient. Okay, so basically, I'm, I'm I I reduce my problem from an n square problem to estimating n coefficient, and estimating n coefficient is much easier than estimating n square matrix entries. Okay, so this rotation invariance uh, hypothesis um, is extremely strong. It, uh, it's, it's strong in two ways. It reduces the, the radically the national theory of the problem, and it allows you to use a very powerful tool of of rotation invariant matrices, which 
which uh, when they're large become asymptotically free, and then you can use all the work of Wojtulescu on, on, um, on freeness. Okay, so I'm gonna break here and we'll reconvene unless there are questions about this. So, is it so um, uh, clear that um, this class estimator in, I mean, apart from the natural uh, argument that yeah, mm -hmm. you don't have prior and, and so the only basis you know is the one of the data. Is there like a stronger argument that shows that it is like the Bayesian optimal uh, well, estimator it, belongs to that class? Yes, as, as, uh, if, you, if you write a Bayesian estimation and you say that the, your prior on C is rotation invariant, then you can show, uh, you can show this property. Yeah, um, so so yeah, the, the, that's one. That's to me that from I, I I like Bayesian estimation, so uh, I, I'm I'm comfortable with it. So in that sense, uh, to me, that is the best proof of this is that you 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 write uh, p of c given e as p of e given c times a prior p of c. You say the prior p of c is rotation invariant. You look at that a little terms in the equation, and you can show that. Um, well, you can show first that 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 the estimator uh, satisfies this property, and 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 you can easily convince yourself that it will commute with the matrix E, and um, yeah. And it says actually, with, with, uh, I won't do this, but because it's it's almost it's too abstract. It's super quick to do it. Really, it's kind of in a in a um, in a free. Uh, if, if, you, if you forget about random matrices and you just think of these as non commuting objects, and you can actually write that this estimator is just going to be the, the conditional expectation of, uh, of C given E. And if you do write this abstractly, you get very quickly the, the Le Dois Péché equations. But I think this is a bit too abstract. Um, uh, I have a little section in the book where I do that, but, um, but you don't get any, any insight uh, on where it comes from. But so so and, and and then then in free well I think uh, yeah I, again I'm not an expert on free probability but but for for people uh, in free probabilities it's pretty obvious that the conditional expectation of e of c given e must commute with e but it's a bit abstract to me still so, yeah. Um, yes, uh, can can the uh, so the, uh, can the um, the hypothesis about rotation invariance can be relaxed to permutation invariance? Uh, I don't know how to solve the permutation invariant problem, but in, indeed, uh, permutation invariance is much more natural, uh, but but uh, but much harder to uh, yes. Can you? But can you do can you do the inference problem? We'll see. Okay. We'll see. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I. Okay. Okay. So, because I'd be really curious of the the permutation invariant prior. Um, yeah. Okay. So the, the, the okay the the. the, the yeah, so I don't know, but I don't know if in the end you get you can get a practical answer that you can build a portfolio and. Okay, <laughs> okay, so uh, somebody tomorrow send me the answer. <laughs> I won't be there, unfortunately, but okay, so let's break maybe.